And thank you, Lord, that he is not dead but alive. And by the work of the Holy Spirit alive in us who believe. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Let's turn together in God's Word to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And as we do, we're going to look at verse 66. We're going to come to the end of the chapter. We're actually going to go into chapter 23. Our challenge today is going to look at the trials that Jesus went through. He didn't just simply have the, the trial with Pilate, the civil trial, but he actually had more than one civil trial and more than one religious trial. And as we look at these scriptures today, you know, the irony oftentimes is, is, is in these stories, we come to find out that it's not Jesus who is subject to judgment in that moment, but those who are trying to, to, to hold Jesus into account. Last week, we looked at three men's lives who were beautifully and powerfully touched by the grace and mercy of the cross. Barabbas, who was set free with Jesus going in his place. The thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. And of course, the honored cross of Simon of Cyrene, that he got to carry that cross. Today is not as happy of a news. It's going to be three groups or three individuals who reject Christ. And we're going to look at why. Now, from an unbeliever's standpoint, their stories will look very familiar and very easy. But our challenge today is, why do we as Christians often keep Christ at arm's length or stay in a very immature state in our walk with Him for very similar reasons? And we're going to hope that today that this will be a, a moment of encouragement, but also a challenge. You know, I think about that it's the story that I began our service with with Joshua. You know, the question wasn't where the, 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 the commander of the Lord's army stood. It was a question of where Joshua stood. And when he recognized the Lord and his power, he made the adjustment. And I pray today as we look at the beauty of our Savior that we will not hold back, but give him our best. And so with that in mind, we're going to look at uh, three specific trials today that Jesus was subjected to before he went to the cross. Let's start at Luke chapter 22, verse 66, and we'll look at the first trial before the Sanhedrin. I'll give a little commentary as we go through this just to kind of keep us on track. It's a, it's a lengthy passage, but... Stay with me and, and concentrate as best you can so that when we come into the Word together, we can, we can move through it uh, deeply and powerfully. Verse 66 of Luke 22, At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Christ, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, I, If I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, Are you then the Son of God? He replied, You are right in saying I am. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Now we're going to transition to the first time Jesus is with Pilate. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he, he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. So now we transition to Herod and Jesus being before Herod. When Herod saw Jesus... 
he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he had hoped to, to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in elegant robe. In an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. Then, th- excuse me, that day Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Now we're back with Pilate for the final verdict. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people. And said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. With one voice, they cried out, away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why, what crime has this man committed? I have found him, I found in him no grounds for death, for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with, but with, the, with loud shouts, they incessantly demanded that he be crucified and, the, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. Let's pray. Father, as we we go into the word today, we see these trials, the trial before the religious leaders, the trial before Herod, the trial before Pilate. And we see each one of them rejecting you in their turn each for less than glorious reasons. And we can understand, Lord, in our world, there are many people for less than glorious reasons refuse to follow you as their Lord and Savior. But why we, who are believers, live such mediocre and often very, very shallow lives in you when you are the Christ, the Son of God. And we've made that commitment that not only you are Savior, but you are Lord. And so today, Lord, help us to love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, as we were designed to. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Today, we're going to see three groups or three trials where you almost want to cry. I mean, don't you realize the moment that you're living in? Don't you realize who's standing before you? And that's often one of the human frailties that we have. We often don't realize what's right before us and its worth and value. How many of you have enjoyed watching like Antiques Roadshow? Why do we watch it? Because somebody will go, yeah, man, I found this in my garage or I went to this yard sale and it had like five cents on it and I bought it. You know, and it's like it's some dish worth $10,000, right? They ever watch those kind of shows and that's we want that kind of payoff because it's like, wow, what a story. I mean, it was just laying in somebody's attic and they didn't know what it was worth. One of the best stories that I ever heard about this was from the Philippines. There was a man who was in the ocean. He found an interesting looking rock and he thought it was a good luck charm. So he took it home and he he laid it under his bed as kind of a good luck charm. And it laid there for 10 years. He was getting ready to move at least for a short time to another province and asked his aunt to kind of, you know, you can kind of have the rock or watch over it. I like to kind of keep it, but, um, you know, I'm leaving. I can't take it with me. And so immediately when she looked at it, she realized there was something unique about this rock. She insisted that her nephew take the rock to the government to find out what it was, and he did. It turned out that it was a 75-pound irregular pearl worth in value potentially to $100 million. And it was under his bed. You know, the only lucky charms we have in our house are the ones that have oats and marshmallows. I, I don't have anything. Don't think I have anything like that in my house. But to be face to face with that and not know what it was or not realize its value. And then we almost cry out for, to these men. I mean, we almost plead, you know, can't you see who's standing before you? When the reality is, is you almost get a sense in some way each of these kind of got a sense a little bit 
of who Jesus was and were confronted with that but for shallower reasons, for more base and lowly reasons, rejected him. Let's start with the religious leaders. With the religious leaders, they ask the right questions. They really do. Are you the Christ? Are you the Son of God? These are the right questions to ask. And their conclusion is, is that it's blasphemy. It's only blasphemy if it's not true. And Jesus had clearly demonstrated, not only in their presence, by his words, but by his actions, by his fulfillment of prophecy, and as well by his miracles, that he was, in fact, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And they reject him. They reject him. In fact, they take him to Pilate, even though they had asked the right questions. And remember, I mean, this is the, I mean, they were probably not the same men, but the same cadre of men who, when, when Herod the Great, a different Herod than our Herod in this story, this is Herod Antipas in, in our scriptures today, but Herod the Great, remember when Herod the Great was wondering who these wise men were and where the Christ was? The religious leaders of their time could quote chapter and verse. This was a world very much looking for the Messiah, very much thinking about these things. And Jesus had given clear evidence that he was right in front of them, even kind of, even kind of chastises them a little bit by saying, you know, I could tell you're not going to believe me anyways. Why don't they receive him? What, what is really happening in their hearts? Is this some kind of theological difference between Jesus? They look deep into the scriptures and see that Jesus wasn't the Christ. No, turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. If you have a moment, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27, verse 17 and 18. Even Pilate can see what's really going on in these men's hearts. In Matthew 27, 17, this will sound familiar. So when the crowd had gathered together, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? And then it says this, for he knew it was out of envy, or as some translations would put it, out of self-interest, out of envy or self-interest, that they handed Jesus over to him. It wasn't some deep theological reason that they turned Jesus over to Pilate, that they condemned him. It was because they were jealous and wanted to protect what was theirs. And what was theirs? What was it that they were protecting? What was their self-interest in the face of Jesus? They were in charge. They were, in a sense, in the big chair. They were in control. They had the authority. And at that moment, for them to recognize who Jesus Christ really was, wasn't just to give in to faith, but it was to bow their knee before the great and real high priest, Jesus Christ. The true and eternal high priest, Jesus. And a lot of men would have to get down out of their big chairs. And a lot of men that day would have had to given up control and authority so that Christ could be in control and in authority. And at the end of the day, the reason that was in their heart for their rejection of Jesus, well, they, they talked a big game. Oh, you know, he, he, you know he, he, he's, he's a king against Caesar, and we're just trying to protect our nation. Or, oh, you know, he's speaking blasphemy. At the end of the day, they wanted to protect their place. They wanted to be in control, and they understood that to call Jesus Christ the Christ and the Son of God, which he had clearly proven, would mean they would have to give up control and authority. Now we can recognize and in fact even maybe respect an unbeliever who looks at the cross of Christ and the gospel and says, I don't think I can do that. I want to control my life and I don't want to submit to Christ or to his word. And many an unbeliever comes face to face with Jesus and starts to maybe even recognize him for who he is, but realizes what sacrifice is necessary 
Because we don't simply call him Savior, do we? We call him Lord. And as A.W. Tozer put it, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. But what about us? We can understand why an unbeliever might come face to face with Jesus and say, I can't make that, I can't do that. God gives them that choice. But what about us who say, he's not just my Savior, but my Lord? Henry Blackaby puts it a different way. He says, you know, um, it's, an oxymor- it's an oxymoron to, to call, to say the phrase, no, Lord. Because the moment you say no to him, you're no longer treating him as your Lord. I want you to turn with me to just back in the same book, Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. There's a very familiar passage. I shared this passage, shared this passage more than once. We often put it in the wrong context. It's the wise and foolish builder. How does the wise and foolish builder actually begin? It says, Why do you call me? It's verse 46, Matthew, or excuse me, Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? That's actually the basis of the parable of the wise and foolish builder. I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. So who's the man that stands on the rock? Not the man who just simply says, Lord, Lord, and doesn't do what he says. It's the one who hears what Jesus says and puts it into practice. And then you know this part. He is like a man who builds a man building a house who dug down deep and laid a foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck the house, but he could not, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my word and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and, it, and its destruction was complete. In this scripture, what's the difference between standing and falling? Not whether you call him Lord, Lord. Did you catch that? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? It's whether you actually submit to the authority of Jesus Christ and his word for your life and make it real. Now, we receive Jesus Christ by faith alone. I'm not preaching today a works theology. But we ask ourselves, why do we often stand on such shaky or immature ground as Christians? My guess is for some of us, it's because we want to stay on our throne and stay in the big chair. We want to play that dance with Jesus where we call him Lord, Lord, out of one side of our mouths. But we really, we really want to be the one in control. We really want to be the one that dictates And just like Joshua, what was his responsibility? It wasn't his. It wasn't God's responsibility to adjust. It wasn't the 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 commander of the army, the Lord, to adjust to what Joshua was doing. It was Joshua's responsibility to adjust to what God was doing. Sometimes we forget who we're talking to. Sometimes we forget who is our Lord and Savior. He's not simply some itinerant preacher who lived long ago who's distant from us. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the one that the very universe obeys at the sound of his voice. Why will we not? And brothers and sisters, we sin and we fail and we repent. But we know the difference in our life where we are still in the big chair versus we allowing him to truly take the lead of our lives. We can understand why an unbeliever would come to that moment of decision and say, I can't make that decision to fully obey Christ. But we are the ones who said we have. And is he the one in control? Is he the one in the lead? Going back to Luke chapter 23, for their very base and shallow reasons, they turn Jesus over to Pilate. And what does Pilate do? Well, they're trying, to turn the, they're trying to turn the knife 
in Pilate's side because Pilate at this moment in history wasn't in really great standing with Rome. And so they're really playing up on that aspect of trying to put pressure on Pilate. Ah, he's a threat to Rome. He's a threat to Caesar, not paying taxes, another king. They could care less as those Jews about those particular things. They didn't care that Christ was another king. They knew that they were looking for that other king. They definitely didn't want to pay taxes, and they didn't want to be a part of the nation of Rome. But they knew they could put, the, put, put it to Pilate by bringing up these things. And we're going to find in Pilate, we're not quite there yet in our sermon, but he's just, he's just looking for a way to get out of this. He just wants to keep all of this at arm's length. And he hears the word Galilee, Galilean, and he has his break. Because there is another man who oversees Galilee, and it's not, it's not, it's not Pilate. It's Herod Antipas. Herod happens to be in Jerusalem at this moment, probably like many people who are rather irreligious, because it was a spectacle, it was a sight. It was a fun thing to come into Jerusalem and watch the Jews do what they did. And in fact, many travelers and many people with wealth and affluence who could afford to travel would often come into Jerusalem during that time of Passover because it was interesting, because it was novel. And we can see in the life of Herod Antipas, isn't that what he really wanted? Now, if you remember, Herod the Great was the one that was at Jesus' birth and put the children in Bethlehem to death. Herod Antipas is the one who put John the Baptist to death. For John speaking out against how he was behaving with his brother's wife. But Herod had an interest in Jesus. What was it? Was it because he, were, he wanted to come face to face with the one John preached about? Was it because he wanted to evaluate Jesus for himself? What was the reason Pilate knew Herod would be really excited to see Jesus and it might mend some fences? What was the reason that Herod was really excited to see Jesus? Why? Because he heard that Jesus performed miracles and he was hoping he would perform for him. Talk about the most base reason of all is he, he, came, he, became, he wanted Jesus in his presence because it was entertaining, because it was fun, because it was interesting. It was interesting. And you can almost imagine when Jesus shows up to Herod, it's like, hey, Jesus, here's some water, turn it into wine. Hey, Jesus, here's some bread. Like, feed, the, feed, feed everybody. Hey, Alexander over there, he's only got four toes. Give him, give him the fifth one back. And Jesus wasn't there to entertain. And he's still not here to entertain. What a base and shallow reason to be interested in Christ and what a base and shallow reason to reject Christ. Jesus wouldn't play the game, would he? He wasn't having any of that because the Christ did not come for our idle entertainment or our novelty or for an emotional kick. He came to be our Savior and Lord and to transform our lives. And Herod wasn't interested in that. So he had little to do with him and sent him back. Now, for unbelievers, we often hear them talk about the things the Lord is boring or uninteresting or filling their lives with novelties and, and trivial things just to fill their times and mind. The fact that, you know, in, in, in modern society, we all have the attention span of a goldfish isn't surprising because we literally don't have to ever have a moment where we're not entertained. You can literally now, remember used to how boring it used to be to sit in a doctor's office? Now we got all these little screens that sit with that come with us, or or we have or we we have access to books or whatever, and we just literally we just don't even have time to be bored. We don't have time. We don't need to think. We don't need to reflect. We can always fill our lives with something, and we look at our world today that has largely filled itself with entertainment. Very similar to the Romans, right? bread and circuses, and they'll be happy. And that's kind of our world today. And we look at, we look at unbelievers and we say, yeah, okay. You know, they, they, don't have, they, they want to be pleased and entertained, and the things of the Lord uh, really aren't interested in that. But what about us? You know, the consumer mentality within the American church today is almost overwhelming. Let's face it, for most of us, we wrestle with times where we rather sit in judgment of what's happening rather than being transformed by it. Did I like it or not? Because we're so used to upvoting, downvoting, or rating things versus being touched by them and transformed by them. 
We're far more interested in our tastes and what we like. It breaks my heart the number of people who complain about teachers and preachers for not being interesting enough. I once listened to a pastor who was dynamic. And you have to understand for preachers and for people that work in ministry, one of our greatest temptations is to go and listen to someone else and go, you know, take out the pencil and paper and be like, well, I would have done this. I would have gone there. And I wouldn't have gone that long on that illustration. And Well, they're pretty boring. We do the same thing. And this speaker was, was and he was, one of, he was a great speaker. And he said the Lord broke him of that. He talked about, you know, listening to a young person who stumbled over their words, sharing the truth of Jesus. And he said, I realized in that moment that if I didn't get something out of it, it was nothing about them. It had everything to speak about me. We laid to rest a dear woman in the Lord, a dear senior saint, Thelma. Thelma couldn't get enough of any book that talked about her Savior. She, she studied God's Word. In fact, she, there were some, some of her books were, were, were kind of put out. I think a lot of us have some of those books. Jeremy got one of her Bibles, and her Bible was just filled with just notes everywhere of almost every sermon and just notes beside almost every scripture. She went to conferences, and she was teacher and studied and, and, and did all those things, not because it was entertaining, but because she hungered for her Savior. She was not there to be entertained. She was not there for the dazzle, but the depth. Not for the sizzle, but the substance. Not for mindless entertainment, but maturity. And we ask sometimes why we feel like we're living on milk, because often milk is far easier to digest. And frankly, sometimes, and I think probably in the American church today, we're maybe a little more guilty of seeking the emotional kick than we are transformation. We want to feel good. We want it to be interesting. Brothers and sisters, I'm not, listen, I'm not saying that uh, uh, someone called to, 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 to rightly uh, divide the word of truth ought not to give their best to that effort. But we got to really check that consumer mindset in our lives. And for a lot of us, we find ourselves staying very immature in our walk with God because we're far more interested in style over substance. We're far more interested in the shallow things than really knowing our Savior and our God. I like to think I'm immune to that. But every time I go to another church, I have to have this Matt talk with myself and say, you're not here today to critique Matt. God had an appointment for you to hear his word. And today, it is not you who are judging, but it is you who are being judged according to that word. Grow up. Grow up. Herod Antipas seems so shallow and base, right? Because he's standing, who, I mean, this is the God of the universe. This is the Alpha and Omega. And he's like, this ain't entertaining enough. Really? You know, when we get to heaven, just gazing upon the beauty of the Lord will be an eternal joy. When we get an opportunity out of our love of Christ to seek him now, to plumb the depths who he is and to stand in the ocean of his greatness. Let's not allow the immaturity of our age and the consumerism to stand between us and taking drinking deep of the things of God. The final trial is the one that we think of most, and he's finally back before Pilate. And as Jesus stands before Pilate, and you can read in the other accounts lots of details about that moment with, with Pilate, and as we see Pilate dealing with Jesus, what is the general attitude of Pilate? I just want to get out of here. Like you see Pilate, he's like water. Water follows the path of least resistance, always looking to just get back to equilibrium. They say of cows, the cows generally are happy if they're well-fed and just left alone. Pilate just wants to be well-fed and left, I don't know about well-fed, but he just wants to be left alone. And you see this man just trying to negotiate the whole thing. And yet at the same time, too, the scriptures are clear that he recognizes that Jesus is innocent, yet for his part, he doesn't commit to it. 
He doesn't commit to what he knows. And he knows and he testifies that Jesus is innocent. Now, does he recognize that Jesus is a Christ? We had, you know, let it, let it say what it says when it came to these, he's the king of the Jews. But for his part, he recognized Christ was innocent, but wouldn't commit to it. Kept it at arm's length. Wouldn't put all the chips on that number, so to speak. But danced with it. Ah, Galilean, go to Herod. Barabbas. Maybe this will get me an out. I'll have him punished. Maybe that will abate them, even though he's innocent. What an evil thing to do. Wash my hands of it. And even say in the face of the one who is the truth, what is truth? In, 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 we read that Pilate says, what is truth to Jesus? And it's not because he's on a quest for truth or he's asking what truth is. It's a dismissive statement. So he doesn't have to get involved. So he doesn't have to really believe what Jesus is saying. And although he knows Jesus is innocent, he won't commit to it. And when it comes to the commitment that is required as a follower of Jesus Christ, it begins with faith. But to live as a disciple, what did Jesus say? We understand why an unbeliever might look at the call of being a follower of Jesus Christ and say, I don't know if I can do that. Jesus even recognized that. He says, who builds a tower? He doesn't sit down first and, realize, and, 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 and look to see if he can't finish it. Or what king goes to war and realizes whether or not he can win or not? I'm paraphrasing those. We understand why an unbeliever might look at the call of Christ and say, I'm, I, I don't think I can do that. Brothers and sisters, how many of us have said we are his disciples? How many of us have said we believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God? How many of us have said he is Lord, yet does our commitment to that truth reflect that truth? Does the evidence of the commitment of our lives show that we believe that. Herod believed, or at least he said Jesus was innocent, but his commitment showed it was far more just wanting to stay out of this, keep it all at arm's length. He didn't want to go deep. He didn't want to have to make a stand. He didn't want to have to go any further. He wanted just to stay out of this and get back. He wanted to be watered, take the path of least resistance. Brothers and sisters, how many times do we find ourselves for lack of commitment to what we believe? and a lack of commitment in living out what we believe as a primary issue in our lives. Sometimes it's easier just to keep it all at arm's length. Sometimes it's easier to say, you know, let someone else. Sometimes it's easier just take the path of least resistance. But out of one side of mouth, we're saying, yeah, he's, you know, he's the great I am. He's the all in all but we don't treat him like the all in all. If there's a difference between my first point, my first point was if he is who he says he is, he's in control and authority. And we got to give that up. What's the difference between that and this point? The difference I would say is there's one thing. It's one thing to say, I obey Christ. It's another thing to say, I give my best to Christ. Pilate wouldn't put all in on Jesus. Tried to keep it at arm's length as much as possible. He just didn't want to get involved. And I challenge myself, you know, one of the, th one of the metrics, you know, as they look at church health, one of the metrics that they look at is measures of commitment. And with each passing decade, the level of commitment of the body of Christ, not just to the things of the body, but to Christ himself, things like prayer and time in the word, things like obedience, and what we take into our lives, and what we choose not to bring into our lives, every decade has gone down. Over the last several, ever the last, you know, 50 years. I can so easily say, I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all of my mind, with all of my strength. But does the commitment that I live out to Jesus Christ reflect that? As a follower and as a disciple of Jesus Christ, I'm called to take up my cross and follow him. 
And listen, in our flesh, we'll never fully accomplish it. We're always going to be running the race and always pressing ahead. But we know the difference in our life of whether we're giving Christ our best or we're just kind of hedging our bets and keeping it at bay. We would have known clearly if Herod, excuse me, if Pilate was truly committed to the innocence of Jesus or not. And we know he wasn't. We know he wasn't. It was just something he said. Or if it was something he believed, he wasn't willing to make the sacrifice to make it happen. I, I challenge us today. I challenge myself today. I ask myself, not I ask myself, you know, in my time with the Lord, you know, do I give him the best of my, who I am in those moments? Or do I give him the leftovers? When it comes to my time, talent, and tithe, you know, the substance of who I am and, and the things I have to offer, does he get the leftovers or does he get the first fruits? I ask myself, when it comes to being a light for Jesus, is it a twinkling little blip? Or is it a city on a hill that can't be hidden? And I tell myself and I tell others I know what he's worth. He is the pearl of great price. It's worth selling everything for to have. Does my, my life reflect that commitment in Jesus Christ? And for Pilate, it was for a very trivial reason. He just didn't want to get involved. He just wanted the path of least resistance. He just wanted the easy way out. And I pray that you'd long for more than just the easy way out. More than just a simple saving faith that you long to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. As we look at where we've been today in God's Word, we see three trials and we're reminded that it's not Jesus who was on trial. And it was not His heart that was being exposed. For the religious leaders, they knew to recognize Jesus for who He really was, they'd have to give up their place and authority. For Herod, he spoke of the things of Jesus and treated Jesus like a novelty, not like the God of the universe. And for Pilate, he just wanted to keep it all at arm's length versus going all in in Jesus Christ. I don't know how this word hits you today. I know how it hits me. My prayer coming into our service today was that each one of us would recognize that as we come into God's presence, it's up to us to adjust to where he is. I pray that that's a joy to you. We take a moment to repent, and that can be hard. But the joy of obedience and adjusting to our, li our lives to Jesus Christ is not a heavy thing but a wonderful and joyous thing. And if God has spoken to your heart today about, about something that he's calling you to be or to do in light of the word today, repent, believe, and obey. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We, 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 we turn our attention towards leaving, maybe going to Sunday school, maybe heading home. And as the word strikes us, as the word hits us, it's very easy just to turn the page and move on. But if you've spoken to our hearts today by your spirit, Lord, I pray that we would repent and that we would adjust our lives to you. That we wouldn't look at other people today and say, ah, I see where they're weak and what they need to do. But that we look at our own hearts, Lord. Today has been a, a little heavier day than what we've had in the last couple of weeks. Yet in those deeper moments, some of the greatest joy comes. Because we find that, Lord, we were made that you would be our Lord. We were made that you'd be more than just entertainment or just a novelty, but that we could go deep with you. We were made, Lord, 
to be your disciple and to, to pick up our cross and follow you. And that's where the joy is found. And I pray, Lord, today that, that, that this message will not come as a, as a burden added to anyone's shoulders, but as a moment of greater freedom in Christ as we live out what you've called us to be. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Fitting song to close our service on today. Number 49 in your hymnal, Where He Leads.